Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the seminar, Cybersecurity Threats to Transport. My name is Juliette Foster and over the next 90 minutes I'll be analysing this subject with the help of a panel of experts who are distinguished. They might beg to differ, but they are distinguished. You'll also have an opportunity to take part, but before you do, please put your, before you put your questions to the panel, could you please introduce yourselves and also give the name of the organisation or publication that you represent. Now, transport is vital to the infrastructure of every country, hence the need to ensure that its protection is more than just adequate. As cyber technology has grown, so too have the risks posed by hackers who've graduated from data breaches to causing actual disruption to physical infrastructures. Transportation hubs for sea, air and rail are as much a focal point for terrorists as they are for those involved in people trafficking and drug smuggling. Major airports like Britain's Heathrow, which handles over 73 million passengers a year, have responded to these dangers by upgrading their security technology, allowing them to monitor passengers, ensure their safe transit, whilst identifying potential threats. In the logistics industry, the vast quantities of data used to transport goods in supply chains have made the sector especially vulnerable. The frequent use of goods tracking systems and real-time control applications with web interfaces has exposed a growing number of weak points that must be managed across a large supply base. The rail industry is also dependent on IT and automation, yet as it adapts to a changing environment, new vulnerabilities to physical networks are continually presenting themselves. An example occurred in 2008 in Poland, where a 14-year-old boy modified a TV remote control to hack into the local train network, giving him access to the tram system. By manipulating the change track points, he successfully derailed four trams, injuring 12 people. Now, such incidents are alarming given the recovery time and the number of cyber attacks that occur each year. Was the former US Defense Secretary Leon Panetta onto something when he described these vulnerabilities in relation to his own country as dangers and as, quote, a cyber pearl harbor? Let's meet our panel, starting from left to right. Jean Soroka is the executive director for the Port of Los Angeles, the busiest container port in North America, where he manages a budget of more than a billion dollars per day, I believe. You're busy. <laughs> Sitting next to him is Henrik Kietzner, who's the principal business solutions manager at the analytical data management and software giant SAS. Sitting next to him is Stéphane Paré Beaumont, Vice President, Market and Portfolio at Alstom Digital Mobility. And Peter Kummer, who's the Chief Information Officer and member of the Executive Board of the Swiss Federal Railways, or SBB. Now, each panellist will give an introductory statement. I had said three minutes when we first met, but I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give you four. <laughs> And afterwards, there will be a discussion followed by an audience question and answer session. So you will be given the opportunity to get involved. So let's begin with the first of our speakers, Jean Soroka. The floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon. My role as leading a very large infrastructure agency comes with a number of complexities. And they start with the permutations of how many people are involved. And just a couple of quick statistics. There are more than 200,000 cargo owners that utilize the services of the Port of Los Angeles each year. And no one cargo owner has more than a 2% market share. There are 13 different marine terminal operators run by 11 different companies using 10 different operating systems today. And that's complemented by the 15 or so major shipping lines that utilize the Port of Los Angeles for on and off carriage of their cargo. Two Western railroads who are building 100 trains per day, each of which is no less than three kilometers in length. And about 16,000 truck drivers who move roughly two thirds of our cargo in and out of the port on a daily basis about 60,000 truck moves every day. So you've got a lot of people involved and a lot of activity. In all of that, we're moving, as Juliet said, about $1 billion worth of goods through the port complex every day, 
of $300 billion a year. So there are a lot of people involved, some very famous names in the retail community, manufacturing, and some not so famous names that make up a lot of our cargo, family-owned businesses, people that ship a finite amount of cargo that means every bit to their business as it would for a very large multinational conglomerate. Within all of that operational setting, we've got to watch out for the physical security of our port and its operation, the regulatory aspect of our trade, not only in the United States, but with the EU, with Asia, China, et cetera. And in that, we decided about four years ago that it would be important for us to stand up the United States' first ever Cybersecurity Operations Center, or CSOC as it's called. Today, that Cybersecurity Operations Center detects about 20 million threats per month, or one threat every eight seconds. We go into that Operations Center, and it looks very similar to a lead public agency a bunch of flat screen TVs showing the entire globe and where these potential threats are coming from, IP addresses, scans on social media, chatter by known actors and the bad guys. So we've got a pretty good look at what happens. But the sheer volume, once again, not only of just cargo that moves, but information that flows through becomes very, very complex. Combined with our neighboring port of Long Beach, California, we account for about 40% of all United States imports. And as, as you know, the United States economy is driven by 70% consumer purchasing, just like folks buying regular goods and services. That's 70% of the economy. So if anything were to impact that port complex, it would impact the economy nationwide. There are about a million jobs in Southern California that are tied directly to this port. Administrators, truck drivers, logisticians, et cetera. About 30% of all working Californians have a job in the supply chain or transport sector. And in the US, we account for about one in 52 jobs. So that impenetrable wall of where information is flowing, that glass pipeline, is not only imperative to the goods movement itself, but how we protect it. We also are one of the only ports worldwide that are now ISO certified at the 27,001 level, which gives us some level of certainty around how we train, how we look at best practices, what we replicate, and how we certify the work that we do. It's encouraging, but there's much more that needs to be done. There must be a partnership that's developed between the government sector and representatives like myself with the private sector. And that has to be done without so-called government overreach. It must be a true partnership. Developing an ISAC or an information center that shares data, details, occurrences, similar to what some may call a fusion center, is the next bridge that we have to cross. And that hopefully can bring together the private with the public, at least in our region, to develop further what we want to do. In addition, we need to be much more compatible and collaborative with other marketplaces, which is part of the reason I spend so much time in Europe. Not only do we have some ideas that we can share, but I think more importantly, there's much more that we can learn. And part of that transfer of knowledge is extremely important to us. In closing, we need to continue to raise awareness of how important this aspect of our business is, but the awareness of everyone. Even our employees take cyber training to understand simply that you can't just open an attachment to an email from an author you're not familiar with. You'd think that would be easy, but it's not. We all have to be reminded on a regular basis. The non petty attack that we saw last summertime was run in parallel to our new information sharing agreement that has been fashioned with General Electric's transportation unit to share info across all of our stakeholder groups in the supply chain. At the same time in parallel with the non petty attack, 
our information system was not touched whatsoever. But there will be a time where we have to continue to expand on that and get smarter every day. And then finally, creating standards in the industry. Something that in liner shipping and terminal operations is not commonplace today, but we'll need to really catch up very fast. And I look forward to the rest of the dialogue here this afternoon. Dean Soroka, thank you. Henrik Kessler, your turn. First off, um, congratulations to Jean. It sounds like you, you, you're approaching this in a very, very sane and sensible and measured fashion. I very much applaud that. Very much recommend that as a model to everybody. I wanted to start just with a couple of remarks about the threat landscape generally and then talk about transport as an element of critical national infrastructure and its vulnerability and its relative attractiveness as a target. The threat landscape, it's very easy to generalize and say, oh, well, you know, they're hackers, they're out there, and, you know, they're, they're, they're bad guys and they're going to get us. But actually, there's a, a great deal of nuance there. And you have to think in terms of aggressor, you have to think in, both, in terms of both capability and intent. Now, the capability to mount a cyber attack is widespread and it's spreading ever wider. Very sophisticated tools, very sophisticated approaches, even whole organizations are available out on the internet, easy to find, either for sale or for rent. So it's within the compass of even the most imbecile criminal to uh, resource a cyber attack. The people who are likely to be mounting serious cyber attacks, though, are not, you know, the, 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 the pale kid in his, in his mum's basement and not necessarily the terrorist. The people for whom this is interesting are state actors, that's to say nation states, who a number of whom have now declared hybrid operations as being their preferred way of executing conflict, hybrid being a combination of conventional military action, political action using things like manipulation of the news, and uh, cyber action involving disruption or damage to uh, critical national infrastructure, and criminals because criminals have found this is a great way of making lots of money at a relatively low rate, re relatively low investment of risk and a relatively low investment of resource. And I point you at WannaCry and other similar ransom, ransomware attacks as being the shape of the future for many. And I can imagine circumstances where, for example, uh, the managing director of a leading car manufacturer wakes up one morning, checks in his inbox and finds a beautifully composed email saying, unless you send us $50 million in Bitcoin, every vehicle you've made in the last two years is going to stop working tomorrow. And that's the sort of thing, that's the stuff of which nightmares are made. I talked about transport as a s fragment of the critical national infrastructure, and I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. Transport covers everything from the, the movement of people, through the movement of goods, through the distribution of services by, 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 by transport means. And it includes all the various logistic functions that go towards making sure the supermarkets are full, making sure that uh, you know the, the, the power stations kept topped up with whatever it is they burn. And it is an absolutely critical element of the, cr the already critical national infrastructure. Now, we in the West tend to organize our critical national infrastructure, our CNI, through commercial providers. We don't have single monolithic state organizations that do everything. And that works well. It's, it's efficient and it's effective. What it is, though, is it's makes life quite complex in the security sphere. Uh, governments can regulate themselves. Governments can say to ministries, you know, you will do this and they will do that. And governments can say to agencies who work directly for government, you will do this and they will do that. Governments are reluctant to regulate commercial providers for good reason, because if you regulate commercial providers, they'll treat that regulation as a business risk. So there's very definitely a, a, a very nuanced approach that has to be taken. And there is a responsibility on both sides, as Jean said, both on the side of government to understand the motivations and the requirements of a commercial entity in putting up a security organization, and on the commercial organization to understand why it is that government is giving them a hard time. Typically, a problem encountered for most security companies or most security operators is generating a compelling business case for an investment in security inside their, their entity. Because it's very hard to prove a negative. It's very hard to put together a convincing narrative that says, well, look, you know, if you give me $50 million, I'll spend that $50 million and we probably won't lose $100 million anytime soon. That's not a compelling business case. And it's very, it, it can be very hard to construct that. There are ways and means, and we should be better at that. And we should be better, we in the vendor community should be better at helping people craft those compelling business cases. Similarly, um, we should be a lot more focused and single-minded about exactly what it is we're trying to protect. You can't possibly protect everything. Something bad is going to happen. 
what we have to do is we have to accept that in order to cope with something bad happening, we need to be resilient. And resilience implies the ability to resound very, or re resound very quickly from an impact. Um, spend the minimum amount of time transitioning to crisis mode, the minimum amount of time in crisis mode, and the minimum amount of time coming back out of crisis mode, because those are the expensive parts of it. If the organization is going to survive at all, it has to reduce that vulnerability. And the way to reduce that vulnerability is for the organization itself to be resilient, for it to have established policies, procedures, and processes that it exercises and it keeps updated, to ensure that its technology and its processes are kept up to date and commensurate with the level of threat and hence the level of risk that those threats generate, because after all, as we all remember, a risk is a threat that's been assessed for both impact and likelihood. And that wherever possible, those elements of CNI that share a, pro a common problem cooperate. And there again, I go back to Jean's idea that this is absolutely right. By and multilateral relationships between CNI operators and between people who are subject to the same threats and who live in, a, who, who live in the same tough neighborhood make perfect sense. And often, as a self-starting move, will get you further along than relying on government. Because here's a hot tip. Government will probably not help in the short term. It may well be of use in the, in the long term, but when something bad happens, unless you're an incredibly vital defense contractor, there's going to be very little point looking to government. So having gloomed everybody off. <laughs> we'll, su we'll survive, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan. Thank you. So uh, many things have already been said, so uh, maybe my, my speech, introductory speech, is going to be uh, shorter than the, uh, than the four minutes. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate what you both said on, on two things. Uh, one, uh, the, the risks are real. They're already there. You said that, uh, Juliet, and you mentioned even the railway uh, examples, and you know, we are both railway with, uh, with, uh, with Peter, so we appreciate that. You said that the, the we have to look at uh, the risks and making sure that we have a good estimation of the risk so that we put in, in place the right mitigation. Otherwise, we are going to kill ourselves collectively in something which is not going to be practical in the, uh, in the end. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to jump on another thing that Jean said, and I, I, I liked it very much, is it's, it's up to everyone at the end of the day. All of us, all of our people, need to be aware of cyber threats. And, you know, I'm going to say that ultimately it goes through uh, training, awareness of people, young people, you know, making sure that we get the proper people with the proper mindset out of school so that they, they, they come into the organization with already the right uh, behavior, the right reflex. Now, I'm going to, because I'm a provider of, of railway system, I'm going to say, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that are typical to, uh, to railways. Uh, we have pride ourselves in the railway industry to, to deliver safe and reliable um, solutions globally and uh, at the end of the day we need to keep this very very high level of uh, uh, again safety and reliability baking into the cyber uh, the cyber threats and the cyber uh, um, um, mitigation measures that we uh, that, that we need to develop because again the the, the threats are here uh, the thing is that in the railway system the, the 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 threat can come from everywhere you know we are along the track, we are on board trains, we are in big control center. There are so many ways to break into a, a railway system that we need to protect ourselves that the, uh, the, the, the deployment of cyber is, is you know, quite tricky, much trickier than, uh, than what we can find in, in IT. Uh, in IT. Uh, I see that uh, there was a comment that IT and OT are merging together. I agree with that uh, since, you know, Again, more and more digitalization. However, OT will always have uh, the, the specificities to, uh, to, to cope with um, the, the, the operation of the world. I mean, I can't stop the railway just to, to, um, to, to you know, better not, to, uh, just to deploy a patch because of a, a security risk. So all of this has to be taken into account when, you, um, when, when you're talking about transportation modes 
and, and railway is one of them. Now, another thing that I wanted to share with you is the, the complete life cycle of the, uh, of the solution. It starts from you know, the early days of, of specification, designing something, when you have to have these uh, risk analysis and, uh, and, and you know, making sure that you do the right things, but it goes to manufacturing, it goes to testing, commissioning, operation on the field, because if these uh, good mitigation measures that we've, uh, we've put in place are not kept along uh, the, the, the life cycle of the, of, the, uh, of the solution, then, you know, some people are going to get smart into breaking into them anyway. So, you know, think about how long a railway system is made for, you know, 20 years, 30 years, much longer than the, the, the life duration of the building blocks of technology that we have into. And even though that's, uh, that's the case, we have to get ready for those cyber attacks and we have to make sure that the, the, the system ultimately, transportation ultimately is few to proof to these um, to these cyber attacks. And these cyber attacks are going to come every day more and more uh, in, in number and more and more in, 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 in the way they get smarter. And, uh, you know, as a conclusion, I would say that it's going to be a, a, a collective effort. It's not a one-man show. I mean, all the stakeholders in transportation mode, whether our government, whether our providers, whether our agencies, whether we have to work together and share the awareness, share the threats. Uh, there are a couple of global initiatives uh, in, in these part of the world, in other places, uh, that uh, are, are very good, and we, I think we need to support even uh, them more putting more resource, more effort into that so that at the end of the day, we have a commonly agreed uh, uh, way to look at those, those threats, methodologies, uh, uh, standards, whatever. But something very important is sharing the information so that we can address that. So that at the end of the day, you know, together as stakeholders in transportation, we, we, you know, we, we bring a more secure world, a cyber secure world to the, in front of the growing uh, demand of, of mobility that we will face in the, in the years to come. Thank you. And Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, Henrik already said a lot about the threats in uh, railway um, uh, business. Maybe some words about uh, SBB. SBB is the largest transport company in uh, Switzerland. We have uh, more than uh, 30,000 people working with us. And uh, we are an integrated uh, railway company saying we uh, run uh, passenger trains, cargo trains, we have the, uh, the tracks, uh, we have the buildings, we have uh, power plants, we have uh, telecom communication uh, company, so we are integrated uh, company. Talking about cyber and, uh, and uh, IT, we have a big IT department, central uh, organized, and OT, as already mentioned by uh, Hendrik, is all over the company. So OT means the technology you have in the trains, in the buildings, in the plants, is everywhere in the company. And the uh, third issue about awareness, we are running since six or seven years now uh, fishing tests all over the company. And uh, they are really disappointing. The best result has been 10% of all the people have been willing to put user ID and password. This was the best result. We have had years where we had 40%. So 40% of the employees have been willing to put user ID password in, the, uh, in, a, in a phishing mail. So this is a really big threat on the behavioral side. So what is the current uh, situation? OT is more and more connected with uh, business IT, as already uh, said. The two areas are no longer separated, merge with concepts such as uh, Internet of Things, they merge uh, together. And the second big trend we see um, in the area of software development from traditional waterfall-oriented, centrally controlled software development processes to agile structures. That's the second uh, trend. And uh, all these developments increase the surface for cyber attacks um, on, on the company. And what's the what are the measures uh, that we put in place uh, against this? We increase our maturity in terms of prevention, especially 
in the OT uh, department to get the same high level as in business IT. The second is we put much more power in detecting and reacting on cyber attacks, not only preventing, of course, prevention is still uh, key, but we invest more to detection and uh, reaction. And the third is we increase awareness and skills to provide uh, better security solutions. So as a summary, up to now, I think the security level is uh, okay, but it will not be enough as those two uh, areas, OT and IT, merge uh, together. SVB is investing a lot, especially in, um, in reaction and in detection. And uh, the third point is the most important point for me. Cybersecurity is much more about behavior, about human, about skills and awareness than it is about technology. Thank you very much. So plenty there. Let's try to explore some of those points. And of course, you will have the chance to put your questions to the panel. If there's something you disagree with, then don't be afraid to raise your hand and say so. But from my point of view, and I'm the non-expert here, you all seem very clued up about the, the, the dangers of cyber terrorism, the, the, the threats they pose to various businesses, etc. That's very reassuring. But is that true of most captains of industry, most corporates, do some of them feel that perhaps the risks are overplayed or that maybe, yes, cyber terrorism is, is a problem, but the real problem is terrorism? Who would like to tackle that? Well, <coughs> there are actually two questions there. The first is, you know, is terrorism a thing? And yeah, terrorism is a thing. I, I prefer not to talk in terms of terrorism as, a, as, an, as an activity or about terrorists because terrorism is a set of techniques used by those who are asymmetrically disadvantaged to exert leverage on those who they could not otherwise impact, so techs and everything. Um, the current users of terrorist techniques find other means of expressing themselves more attractive than incredibly complex cyber attacks, which is not to say they won't do it, it's just they're more likely to run people over in the street or blow them up or do other stuff that gets them onto the front pages in a, in, 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 in a more illuminating manner from their perspective. That said, it doesn't much matter who it is that's attacked you if you've been attacked. And um, what's the best way of, what's the best way of, remind, remind me again of what the first part of your question was. I, I was actually paying a compliment to everybody in the mm. first part yeah. because you're all, yeah, you're all was, very um, clued up. How, how, clu how clued up are people? Well, I think generally speaking, pretty much everybody in the IT industry, pretty much everybody in the security industry knows this stuff and is keenly aware of it. I did refer to this in my introduction when I talked about the inability to raise a business case. And we have, we have there to think in terms of how a company works. Typically, uh, the security function is a cost center inside a company. Now, a cost center inside a company has two ways of securing investment. It can either prove, it can either show that an investment will cause less downstream cost, or it can show that an investment will generate a greater a greater effectiveness or a, a faster and more agile service and it has to be able to demonstrate both of these unlike a profit center in a company which can make speculative investments cost centers can't as a result the CISO the chief information security officer and the CIO often find themselves in the somewhat difficult position of having to justify to a board and to the shareholders because the board may get it but the shareholders may not that you know we need to make this investment because it's a good thing well yeah you, you say it's a good thing but you know let's let's see some numbers because the modern company exists in order to maximize shareholder value. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it does. And the shareholders themselves, if they are the typical shareholders, will, 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 will not be particularly enthusiastic about any investment which doesn't directly lead to a, an upward tick in share, in share value. And that's not bad, it's not good, it's just the way things are. But that does make life rather difficult for those, secure, those seeking these sort of investments. And even a chief executive even the chief risk officer is only going to have a limited amount of discretionary budget at his disposal. And he's not going to have a budget for everything. And there'll be plenty of other things that any spare money in that company needs to be spent on. And even though this is potentially speaking an existential issue, and even though cyber security is a hugely important issue, it's not necessarily the single most important issue a company is looking at. So there's a, there's a degree of mass massaging of internal perception required. There's a degree of internal negotiation required. And this is where 
you know, media and government can actually be very helpful because media and government can actually generate realistic advice, realistic journalism, realistic guidance, which doesn't over dramatize and doesn't over doesn't doesn't render over sensational the issue, but lays the issue out in very stark, very factual terms that this is a problem. We all acknowledge it's a problem. Some of this problem can be made to go away. Some of this problem can be made to be less of a problem with some shrewd investment. And this, this is what we, the government, this is what we, the media, are saying. And that can often have a useful, up, a useful pressure both on shareholders and on boards. But I'll pass this on to my corporate colleagues now. <laughs> yeah, it, that's one good thing that we've seen come out of this. I think that we're, we're fortunate based on the scale of what the port in Los Angeles is able to do every day, every year, we're at the confluence of all of these activities and companies in the private sector. And that gives us certain convening powers. We can bring people to the table, have a meaningful voice, work on solutions of the operations variety, financial, et cetera. What we're being asked now, because there is a certain level of awareness, and I've been quite pleased with that just as an industry advocate, but what I'm more pleased with is the fact that now I'm getting asked from private sector leadership about read-through economics. So whether it be on information sharing systems that we're designing and how it's going to positively or negatively impact the flow of goods, the same thing is now being talked about if we get shut down or if there is, a, not if, but when there is another attack, what will it mean to me economically? And that's exactly what Henrik was talking about because it then gives these folks at the C-suite level the rationale by the ability to go back to their boards to prepare annual budgets in the effect of what do I need to do now in this space? And that wasn't being done before. So I think we've taken one step in an area that will be very important for us to design and fashion our further strategic vision. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's the tragedy in itself, isn't it? And again, I'm throwing this question out to, to everybody there, but um, in some instances, it takes a shutdown to drive home this message that, look, we have to start taking cybersecurity seriously. And damn it, it is a priority because if something shuts down, then there are economic consequences further on down the line. And particularly where you've got um, a company which is part of a much bigger supply chain, it spreads. Would you like to, to, to further that point? Would you like to further that point, Stefan? Or Peter, perhaps? I do agree, absolutely. Um, maybe uh, I have to, to give this, this uh, example. I don't have any problem now about awareness in the, in the board, in the executive board or in the board of directors. I went with them last year for one day to a cybersecurity ranch. There they could play uh, so around. A cybersecurity ranch. Ranch. A ranch, right, okay. <laughs> they could play around with hackers. There have been a lot of students and they could advise them how to attack their own company. And believe me or not, uh, I don't have any problem now with awareness. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's the opposite around. Were you able I to hack your company, <laughs> by the way? <laughs> I'm now, uh, let's say, with, uh, with the chief information security officer I'm at least three times a year. I'm in the boards. I don't have any problems to get the money to invest uh, for more uh, cybersecurity um, projects. That's not, not the problem. So awareness is uh, very high in the, in the company. And what's your experience, Stefan? Is it, is it similar? Is there, is there very high awareness? I mean, do, do you have any difficulties when it comes to to try and to, to, well, not you personally, but um, <laughs> or so let's say hypothetically. But it, what okay. about the awareness? No, the, the awareness in the company uh, is, is, is quite high. Now, to the point that there is a, a specific entity reporting very, very high into the leadership, which it deals with, uh, with cyber security in our, in our company. Now, maybe, uh, you know, in the railway industry and I speak under your control, Peter, but maybe we, we, we benefit from the fact that uh, the, the railway industry have come through a various level of changes and safety is one of them. So, you know, when you refer to uh, the, the business case of cyber security and say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm here to prevent things to happen and it's not very easy to, uh, to defend the case, 
We've already gone through that in the railway industry when, when, when it was all about defending safety and level of safety, etc. And it's a very similar approach. The big different things uh, that we face today is when you've declared a, 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 a system safe in the railway industry, it's safe forever as long as you operate it correctly, which is not going to be the case with cyber. Cyber is going to be revisited very frequently, let's put it that way. Uh, and that makes, uh, again, the big difference. Now, the awareness, no problem about that. I think that, you know, fr from some example that you've, uh, you've quoted and something that all of us in, in our industry have experienced uh, in, in, in the attack, uh, no problem with the awareness. Now, how you approach that and how you ultimately deliver the level of uh, mitigation uh, with the level of cost, the level of, of uh, pain that we will have to, uh, to, to go through to deploy these things, the level of impact on the operation, we need to make sure collectively that we are doing the right things and we are not overshooting. So doing the right things for the, uh, for the right threat, maybe putting a, a, a series of, of uh, mitigation measures so that if the first barrel is broken, at least there is another one that, that you know, give you a little bit of time to react. You were talking about how to enter into crisis mode, how to exit in crisis mode, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's very, uh, very valid. And if, if we're able to design, again, some, some mitigation that, that goes one after the other and, and give you enough time to, to segregate this, uh, this attack and, and, and again, uh, prevent everything to be, uh, to be corrupted, then we'll, we'll, we'll be in a, in a better shape. But that, again, comes uh, to a, a common alignment on what the risks are and what is going to be the level of effort that we need to put into reaching the, 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 the proper level of, of cyber security. Mm. And one of the other takeaways that I've gleaned from listening to all of you is this idea of cooperation that really everybody has to work together. Now, it's a nice idea in principle, but people are only willing to share so much. And how, how do you overcome that? I mean, I, I don't really know who, who, who wants to take that, take that on, but clearly you have to work together. You're all in the same boat, but not everybody agrees about, about what, what, what they need to, get, to, get to give away. Well, I can, quote you, I can quote you one very good and very, very concrete example, which is that of the, the sister banks in London. Uh, the major banks in London have effectively pooled their security resources, both cyber and physical, for years. And they did it through a, a holding company initially, which was uh, organized by a guy who actually left his job as head of security for one of the banks in order to set this up. But that works really well as a voluntary association of people that have common interests. And while these banks com compete with each other commercially, they have a very clear set of common interests in preserving their own operational and f financial integrity. And that has been extremely successful. There have been other, there are other um, alliances and other associations so that, for example, a lot of the ports talk to each other and have very close relations with one another, uh, railway companies across Europe. So these, these, ex these things exist. And generally speaking, it's communities of interest and communities of shared interest that, that cause this to emerge. Um, elements of critical national infrastructure are still chasing this. And there is still a, there's still a difficulty with CNI. And the difficulty with CNI is, uh, I mean, back to your point about OT and IT. This environment is incredibly fast moving. It's incredibly dynamic. A lot of the environments which are subject to those threats are not particularly dynamic. So for example, if you look at power distribution, can have operational technology that is up to 40 years old in place, sometimes analog, not even digital. And as long as it's broken, nobody's gonna fix it because why would they? And this leads to an incredibly variegated estate and incredibly complex um, situation. Now I'm gonna say the obligatory a word now, which I have to, it's in my contract, but one of the secrets to unpicking some of this complexity is analytics. It's the ability to maintain situational awareness. It's the ability to keep at least apprised of what's happening on your entire network. Because here's the other dark secret. Nobody knows what's on their network nowadays. With bringing your own device, with rogue IT, IT departments setting up here, there, and everywhere, with all manner of people plugging all manner of devices into your network, nobody knows what the bloody hell's out there. So maintaining situational awareness, understanding what the normal looks like, is close to impossible. 
And it's only through the application of analytics, it's only through the application of things like machine learning, it's only through the application of really clever technology that you can begin to get any sort of grasp over what you've actually got and actually understand what normal, what good looks like. Only once you understand what normal looks like can you then identify deviations from that norm. Back in, back in the dark ages, you know, when great reptiles roamed the earth and I was still in the military, my job was in military intelligence. And we used to say, well, the two indicators and warnings of something bad happening are the absence of the normal or the presence of the abnormal. And you can spot either of them, provided you understand what normal looks like. Yeah, just, just a thought in this area that we have so many initiatives around technology today in our industry, which makes up 90% of world's trade, that we have found the need to be really careful about meeting or collaboration fatigue. Wonderful. Yeah, let's get people around who understand the importance and understand what we want to do and how we want to go. So we've got to be sharp. We've got to be very precise in keeping these people really interested because folks get amnesia very quickly. The last event happened and, well, we're just not going to talk about that after a couple of months go by. But we don't remember the pain of the largest shipping company in the world having to remove all 45,000 of their desktops and laptops that the employees used and start fresh. That their productivity was down to 10% of normal activity at their ports and terminals. The, o the other piece around getting folks involved really is, is how we see this and that the ISAC that I mentioned, the Information Sharing and Analysis Center that we are embarking on right now, or Fusion Center to, to many of us, is just that. It's sharing information, inclement weather, unusual patterns of traffic, um, roadworks, things of that, and then blending in to the very high level and sophistication of cyber that can be if you see something, say something. And some of those adages that we've come to know so well today. And that, I think, can keep people very interested and fresh on the topic. We're not jumping at shadows here, but we've got to have, it was a great point, Henrik, the situational awareness and the understanding of when something happens, what do I do? What is my role? And how do we get back to an assemblance of normalcy as quickly as possible? And, and, and uh, to, to combine probably uh, several things that you, you both said, you said about analytics, you said about sharing data, and, and that's something that uh, we see coming from customers, but also from, from agencies, from government, being open. But being open is exactly what we don't want if, if, if we're in the cyber world. So we, we see those trends, you know, conflicting trends uh, coming, and we say, oh, how are we going to manage that? So we, we have to get together and say, hey, uh, let's keep in mind all these different things that we are requesting to do, but again, keeping in mind that we have to do it in a cyber secure way. I can tell you again, a, a, you know, the, the most secure train is the one that doesn't move. <laughs> that, that's for sure. You know, but as a passenger, as a user, as a, an entity, as whatever, we are not going to be pleased with that. We want performance, we want to get there on time, we want to get there alive. And, and at the end of the day, you know, again, it, it's, it's combining all these different things uh, with the, the new trend of sharing the data, making the data open to everyone. Everyone can, can, should be able to do an app to provide some services, whatever. But at the end of the day, if I, if I open the system, I'm opening doors as well. Mm. So again, when it comes to uh, agencies, to government, to mandates, it's, it's making sure that all those stuff remain consistent and that you know, we are not being put under a, 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 a situation where all these constraints uh, you know, result into no solution. Mm. I, I want to pick up as well on, on something which you mentioned earlier, Peter, and again, I'd like the, the panel to, to address this. It was, it was the idea of this, this ranch, this hacker's ranch, because there is one theory that we, we know, of course, that the cyber, the cyber threat is constantly evolving. It never goes away. But what, one way to get across it is to, is to understand, A, who your actors are and, and how they're thinking. Obviously, you do this at 
Swiss Railways because you, you've got this ranch. But is that an idea which is, is catching on elsewhere in, in the corporate world, get inside your attacker's head to really to, to try to stay one step ahead of them? Who'd like to tackle that? Well, I mean, if you're a big company and you specialise in that kind of thing, then yeah, that's what you'll do. Um, it's not core activity, so you know, I don't suppose that the average big industrial can find much time or scope in its budget because it, that's the sort of service, that's the sort of intelligence it will buy in from a commercial provider. Um, you start to get into some fairly dubious territory when you start looking at um, hackers or hacking tools and how they're developed and where they're developed and where they're on sale because sometimes just the very act of looking for them can constitute an offence in some jurisdictions. So, for example, in the UK, you could theoretically speaking be prosecuted on the Computer Misuse Act if you looked aggressively for hacker tools on the dark web, so I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. Um, there are commercial security intelligence providers out there who do a very good job indeed of keeping an eye on these guys, who, who, who keep an eye on the known hacker groups, who keep an eye on uh, the APT groups um, that may or may not be associated with major European power, who keep an eye on some other groups that may or may not be associated with major East Asian power. And you know, as far as they can track their communications and as far as they can maintain oversight on the way their technology is developing. But the thing is, nobody's ever completely up to date. You know, the zero day exploit is a fact. Somebody's always going to be the first to be hit by a new attack. Because unless you've got a magic detection system that can spot things before they happen, somebody's always going to get hit by it first. And until somebody has been hit by something, and until the pattern or the the, the, the identification features for a specific attack, until they are known, they can't be disseminated and people can't be inoculated against them. So somebody's always going to be subject to the zero day. I think it's probably not the norm for the average company to put too much effort into doing its own research, but it's increasing the norm for the average company to buy in that intelligence from people it trusts. That issue of trust it actually is a key one, and it's one that you brought up which is that there are two aspects to this which are absolutely vital. First is, yes, by all means share, but only share with people you trust. And the average company should be very careful about whom it trusts corporately. And there may be some surprising omissions from the list of those it trusts, or those it trusts with the entirety of its data. I'm not suggesting that any, but any company might find it awkward to trust their government completely, but there are circumstances where I could imagine that being the case. Certainly not anybody in this room, I'm sure. The other is that of identity. The ability to assert and protect an identity is absolutely critical to becoming a 21st century citizen, whether you're a corporate citizen or whether you're a personal citizen. And that's the issue that's going to define the next 10 years in computing and eventually in society. Because if we are going to function as a fully integrated, digitalized society, if we are going to function as a completely integrated system of systems under the Internet of Things, we have to be able to know and trust that the person we are talking to, the person with whom we are inter interacting, is who they purport to be. And that's the next big thing. But, you know, that we, we can do that one next year. Yeah. Or the year after. Does anyone else like to follow through at all? No, okay then. Well, I mean, talking about trust, let's stick with that idea. I mean, can we trust governments to prepare for cyber security? Because the fear is, is that perhaps they don't entirely understand the scale of the risk. And when we're talking about the actors who are involved in protecting us, I mean, you, you can't exclude governments, but I mean, how can you actually get them to prepare for the cybersecurity risk if some of them perhaps aren't fully, don't, don't appreciate the scale of it? I feel like I'm hogging this, but the short answer is governments can be trusted to protect governments <laughs> and the organs of government. And they can be trusted to protect those elements of CNI which are absolutely existentially vital to the existence, not the functioning, but the existence of the state. Governments don't have infinite resource. So, you know, take the UK as an example. The responsible entity inside the UK government is in the hundreds, and it comes from an, an agency which numbers barely in the thousands. So it's not capable of looking after the whole national economy, and nor does it have that as its mandate. It does have the mandate to protect government and to protect those key functions which are existential for the maintenance of government and for the existence of the, the nation. Beyond that, you, you're talking an, an, an infinite resource sink. So I don't think it's reasonable to expect government to be able to look after everything. I think it is reasonable to expect government to give good advice, and I think largely government does give good advice, um, if sometimes a little bit behind the curve, because, of course, 
the information flow inside government is not quite as rapid as the information flow in commerce, never mind the information flow in the criminal classes. So sometimes government finds it hard to keep up. Okay, but, let, but let, then let's broaden things out a bit then, because look, at the end of the day, they are important players in this. So again, a question to all of you, how could governments actually prepare for cyber security? We're all in it together, we all have to work together. Well, I, I think start with my agency, and that's one that has access to many private sector companies that do business with us. And it's part of our responsibility, I used that term earlier, convening powers, to get people around the table and try a little bit more from a discussion and solution standpoint. And I think my interaction with the federal government in the US so far has been very similar to what Henrik has, has recommended here. That you've got some good people who are looking after their patch, but they can't really cross that line for sheer volume of information, time and day number of hours to work. But you'll need a few champions to be able to do that. And that's part of what, for me, this trip is about in talking to other government agencies here in the EU to see what type of collaboration can work and as we share. The, uh, the ports also that was mentioned a moment ago do have venues at the national level in the US, which has been very helpful, but also on the international level with the uh, International Association of Ports and Harbors, which can bring people together and has shown to be somewhat successful to date in tackling these issues of protocol, organization, membership, and how we get to a point of discussing what standardization could look like. So trying to have a couple of champions involved, along with those natural platforms of convening, can help tremendously. But again, I would profess to you that we still have a long way to go. And, and I, will, I will just add on what you say, Jim. It, it's also networking of these platforms so that, that we, we benefit from, you know, from one uh, truth station mod to the other one so that at the end of the day we share the, 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 the intelligence and we, uh, and we get smarter. Uh, I agree, I mean, it, 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 there are so many things to, uh, to look at. So uh, I, I would, I would request and I would, I would expect from, uh, from the government that at least they understand what we are, uh, what we are at and they sponsor, they, they push and they, they structure this network so that it, at, at the end of the, of the day they make it happen or, or they, are, they are not going to be in the driving seat but at least they are going to, to, to uh, yeah, facilitate, yeah, thanks, facilitate. So that at the end of the day, you know, we have those groups, different uh, different entities, different set of uh, of uh, actors into one truth station mode, so that I can share information. You share at another level, and, and you have uh, yeah, this sharing of information. And on the other side, you've got these international uh, uh, committees like the IEC, like the the, uh, the 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 program in the EU on, on rail, shift to rail. And, and Senelec and all these stuff, which can help into standardizing how we approach that. So uh, standardizing the approach is not going to, uh, to make us smarter in how we detect things, but it's going to make us smarter into sharing how we apply to things. Mm. So those two are very important, and here government should play uh, a, a role into, into facilitating, sponsoring, uh, uh, making it happen. Even make giving some, uh, some milestone on some day that maybe we find that it's tough to, uh, to, uh, to meet. But at least there is, there is a framework there that, that we can see coming. Mm. And really, uh, uh, well, again, uh, something for all of you really to comment on, but, but the sense of urgency underscored by some of the, the, the big attacks that we've seen. I mean, Jean, for example, you were referring, I believe, to the NotPetya attack. Now, that cost a number of com uh, companies a lot of money, Maersk included, around $1.2 billion. That's a big hit to take. It impacted on the supply chain, but it, it, it almost takes something on that scale to push things along in government circles. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, it is, and that's the reference I was making just a bit, a bit earlier, Juliet, that we saw this, this very large company uh, who was basically relegated to just a fraction of what it was capable of doing and impacting the GDPs of just about every company, uh, country in which it participates in commerce. 
and to those that really weren't paying close attention or weren't joining these meetings that we talk about, that was an extremely violent wake-up call. Uh, but I, I mentioned in, in kind of jest that most of us have amnesia after the news cycle is complete, like we were talking in our pre-meeting, we're all on to another subject of catastrophe or crisis, et cetera, and we've forgotten the one that impacted us most recently. And that, that really has to have some staying power. And it's not meant to keep reminding people of that worst time at that worst day that occurred, but what could happen as others become a little bit smarter concerning the intricacies of the work that we do every day. And I think that has kept the conversation a little bit more fresh. It's kept people at the table as opposed to going back to their daily lives and what they wanted to do. In follow-up as well to the government aspect, uh, I've been involved in congressional hearings in the United States following that attack and some other dialogue at the federal level. And what I have been cautioned on from the private sector of the people that we do business with regularly was they do not want so-called government overreach. Now that could be mandate regulatory at the federal level of whatever country is involved. It could mean legislation by elected officials to try to change industry. And it could be mandates from a port authority, as an example of how you will do business when you enter our waters. That we found in varying ways, all three combinations, have not been as successful as that collaborative effort in trying to push forward with what we want to do. The awareness at the federal level, the ability to facilitate, to champion, to lead discussions will be imperative. But relegating legislators to create law in areas that they may not be experts in or possibly are working with folks who may have access but don't have the day-to-day -day detail that others do can also be problematic, which is why it, it revolves around the responsibility left on those shoulders to make sure that the, the conversations continue and the activities move forward in how industry can help write itself. Uh, the statement of uh, government intervention and it's gonna be too much and sharing information is very challenging well, that's why we wanted to start off with a little different pace. Creating our cybersecurity center, that CSOC as it's called, was one to start protecting the infrastructure, uh, both soft and bricks and mortar around us. We have more fiber in the ground today than most major cities in the world. The ability to extend that fiber from a technical standpoint, where it would give another shield, another firewall, to the private sector is something that we're aspiring to do today. But we understand that it's got to be a step-by-step -step fashion. And that's why this fusion concept of information share, knowing how much is too much, getting folks who aren't necessarily accustomed to sharing into an environment where they understand what a data, a data lake is. They understand how that data can be used better to help them without being intrusive is really the aspiration that we have right now. No perfect science, I don't consider us uh, successful just yet, but I think that willingness and ambition will help drive future success by putting bright minds around the room. Okay, so would anyone else like to add anything before I throw it open to the audience? Yep, let's, you, you wish to, okay. Right, so it's that time when uh, we really throw it open to you. Your input is also important. So is there anybody who would like to put a question to our panel? Don't be shy. Do I see any hands going up? I don't see any hands going up. Maybe my eyes are deceiving me. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to you. I think you've scared them. <laughs> ah, there is a hand that is raised. Excellent. Courage. Could you introduce yourself and also the name of the publication or organization you represent, please. Please stand up. Thank you. The Emission Check from Bosch. Uh, if there is a violation of security, either physical or uh, cyber, it, uh, it leads uh, damages, losses on human life, money, trust, whatever. On the other hand, uh, by today, uh, the it, it's, uh, it is uh, the perception of the cyber security is uh, at high level from the ICT or IT staff of the organizations. Um, my point is, 
if uh, the physical security managers are not aware uh, about the threats of cyber security, uh, they can also have the same problems uh, and bigger problems uh, to, to uh, control their network, uh, to prevent the threats, uh, vulnerabilities, etc. Uh, and of course, uh, you cannot create superheroes who can control physical or uh, cyber uh, security systems. So my question is, awareness is the beginning. What are the next steps to, to increase uh, cyber measures on the, uh, on the minds of physical security managers? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And, and I'll return a question and then get to, get to some thoughts. Um, how many people in here have had their credit cards skimmed or taken advantage of? How many folks have received a phishing email? And then lastly, how many folks have had some kind of a hack into their email or bank account or any other account that's got secure uh, touch points? Okay. No, you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was you. I thought you yeah. hadn't. So I was, I'm quite surprised, but please, yeah. Gene, continue. So I think that answers one of the questions, and we talked about it briefly earlier, that we think in general the awareness around cybersecurity has risen. I think back five years, 10 years ago, 15 when I was living in Asia, has risen exponentially. And from the companies that I speak with on a regular basis, and remember some of those numbers that I shared at the, uh, the opening remarks when I was talking about the complexity of our operation, uh, we're in touch with Fortune 10 companies, Fortune 25, 50, 500, internationally, C-suite level of service providers across the board. There is not one meeting I take that doesn't include an aspect of cyber. And especially now that we're one of the first ports uh, to talk, the US is very far behind in, in an area that we haven't talked about, and that's port community systems very far behind and we're in the midst of implementing I think one of the first in the United States compared to Europe and to an extent Asia we're just light years behind in that sense but at the same time with GDPR which was just enacted I believe on the 14th of this month and other concerns around people such as Facebook whose CEO was just in Brussels yesterday for an underwhelming conversation with officials similar to what took place in Washington. I think there is now an awareness, at least in, in my area of the supply chain and transport, rail, truck, ocean, that is probably as good as it's been in some time. And I've been in the industry about 30 years. The awareness is not only that chief security office, officer, the CTO, the IT manager, et cetera, but it's around the commercial people now. It's the folks who are saying, my customer is asking these questions. How can I be better prepared when I'm in front of that person or that group of people with which I'm speaking to? In my, uh, in my own job, I think last year I spoke in front of 50 audiences or something to that effect. So even though I'm considered a generalist, I now must be very conversant in this area. And hopefully I've demonstrated a little bit of that today. But it's also been a very important aspect of what we're trying to do as a port from a competitiveness standpoint. But to my bosses, the mayor of the second largest city in our country, it is an expectation in my job description now that I can be conversant. So I think it again goes back to what we've been saying collectively, the facilitation, the awareness, the gathering, and making sure people can learn from those unfortunate experience and allow us to plan to the point where when it does happen, we'll know what to do better than we did yesterday, and we'll be better prepared for what tomorrow brings. But I think it's an extremely astute question. The good thing is also that the, 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 this awareness and this mindset is also going to come from the, the people younger than, than the people of the, this community, I'm going to say. I'm going to take my own, well, my own example, my son's example. He, he, he is starting in his engineering school, and he told me, I want to do cyber, and I can swear it was not me who pushed him into that. So the, the, the thing is that now uh, the, 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 
the young generation are much more familiar because of these fable, Facebook things and, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the data being, being stolen, blah, blah, blah. But they, they are much more conscious and they are going to come into uh, the business you know, in a couple of years. Or, uh, and this combined with what, we, what you just said, Jean, you know, the, the, the fact that the sea level are, are, are now well aware of commercial guys are, are, are getting that from their customers and, and their uh, relationship, whatever. And the, the new generation coming, which is now uh, uh, ready for it you know, from day one, I think will, will, will increase the, uh, the, the, this um, reaction time that ultimately uh, we need to get. And you know the, the 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 means to do that are probably the CSOC that you uh, you mentioned, the vulnerability watch, uh, the uh, all of these things that we need to put in place. Uh, you know, in, in in between. But this is going to be this combination of awareness from the top, uh, you know, readiness from uh, from from the bottom for the youngsters, and, and so those additional measures that are going to uh, to, to to you know to, to to make us reach the solution. Maybe one, one more point to add. Well, I do uh, absolutely agree that uh, awareness is uh, much higher now in uh, society, but I'm not sure whether the behavior um, is also uh, increased. When I, as I told, when 20% of the people are willing to put in a user ID password and uh, everybody knows that's, uh, but that's a bad idea. And uh, we have a, a lot of uh, e-learning and sessions where we teach uh, all the, the people, but after three or four months, they, um, they forget it or they like to win this iPad that was uh, supposed to, to win with this phishing email. So I really think awareness is very high, but behavior is uh, not, so, uh, not so high. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a saying in IT that it's usually the wetware that's at fault. And that's the element that sits between the hardware and the software and the, the human. There is a growing perception that security, for a start, no, most people are now not thinking in terms of security. They're quite rightly thinking in terms of risk. They're thinking in terms of risk assessment, risk management, and the fact that it's a cyclic process. And security forms an aspect of that, but it's not the single, single most important part. The second thing is that people are increasingly seeing the convergence between physical security and cybersecurity, and its integration into a cohesive, consistent corporate approach to risk. And only once you've done this, only once you start thinking of all risks as in terms of their impacts and categorizing all risks, not cyber risks here, physical risks there, reputational risks there, commercial risks there, reputation, you know. Only once you start thinking in terms of a single cohesive risk management strategy have you got any chance whatsoever of putting together something that's cohesive and responsive to the market? Now, this necessitates a bit of a shift in thinking. We saw this shift early on in the, 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 the 21st century as companies made the transition from thinking of security as something that had to do with people with shiny hats and badges into something that was to do with the protection, the active protection of their physical infrastructure. And we're beginning to see that same shift now as people are beginning to think in terms of cybersecurity as the protection of the key intellectual property, the key assets, that's to say the information systems, the networks which interconnect those information systems, the services and applications which are delivered across those, and the data which is held on them as being absolutely existential to the company. And viewed in the same light as the corporate headquarters or the human resource or any of the other major assets the company has. In order to be effective though, you do need this cohesive and coherent and, con and consistent risk management approach. So I would commend very, very warmly to everybody present. Jean's already mentioned ISO 27001, which is the principles of um, information security management. The other ISO I would recommend to you is ISO 31000, which is risk management, which is also a brilliant, brilliant document. By integrating the two of them and by building a security organization that's built around the principles of risk management, you'll go a long way to making a lot of this go away. It still won't legislate for the idiots. It still won't legislate for people clicking where they shouldn't click. There are other things you can do. If you have control of your information systems, there are some clever things you can do to make sure that nobody can click through from an email. That may be a little bit brutal for your environment. Are there any other questions? Lady over there, can we get the microphone, please? If you could introduce yourself and your organization, please. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tao Pham. I'm the Associate Deputy Minister uh, of the Department of uh, Transport in Canada. Uh, so I'm government, <laughs> federal government I'm talking about. So I think your comment around the role of government, especially the federal government, really resonates with me. Um, so please indulge me. I'll, I'll kind of set the stage about uh, what we are doing um, in Canada, but also the challenges that we're facing. And I would like to seek your uh, maybe advice on how to, you know, start off on the, the right foot. Uh, so essentially, um, well, as you all know, uh, around cybersecurity, uh, it's something that uh, all governments are really aware of, and including in Canada. Uh, for cybersecurity, we've put in place for the financial sector a table, a multi-stakeholder table that brings together all of the stakeholders in the financial sector. Uh, we are now establishing kind of a similar approach for the transportation sector. But as you know, uh, for transport, we have ports, we have uh, maritime like sh ships, uh, ports, airports. Uh, we have uh, people at different levels of governments, uh, cities, uh, provinces in the case of Canada. But we also have people working in different sectors, including the intelligence sector, right? And transport, the people working on digital uh, infrastructure, but also the critical uh, public infrastructure. So there's a lot of people not necessarily on the same page, not all with the same kind of level of preparedness. Uh, so uh, what would be your advice on how to uh, start off by uh, bringing all of those people together from various perspectives with different levels of pre preparedness and awareness and really uh, set us up for success. Thank you. Okay, who'd like to tackle that? Okay, Heinrich. Start small. Identify those, those communities that have the common interests and common standards of development and encourage them to get together and build a, a series of sort of interlocking nested communities. Offer government as an honest broker you know, facilitate the, these these meetings, but make it quite clear that you know you're just there to make sure that people get together and they get the, they, they they get to talk to each other. You can't mandate people to get together, and you can't mandate people to sit round a room to sit round a table. And it may sound cynical, but my experience is when government puts together task forces, they turn, they turn into job creation schemes for civil servants, and eventually the commercial element drops out because they see little value in it. So you have to be very c careful as government to ensure that what you do continues to provide value to the commercial elements who are the ones you're attempting to attract into it. Because you can, tell you can tell government entities what to do, and they'll do it. If you want, for example, as varied a sector as transportation, if you want that to bring that together into a single whole, I'm not sure that that works particularly well, because exactly as you say, it's a tremendously diverse environment. So you have fixed infrastructure providers with ports and airports. You have communications providers, fixed infrastructure, the rails and light rail. You have the road transportation, which ranges from you know the guy, the guy with his rig to the the, 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 the ten thousand truck multiple, you have the logistics specialists who deliver to the supermarkets. I think it would be a good idea maybe to um, section out the market a little bit more and think think in terms of which which clusters does this fall into naturally, and the clustered not just by activity but also by size and by interest, and that would be my suggestion. We we found a, a similar opportunity in that a lot of the work that I had done in Washington previously as volunteer committee member in various uh, cabinet level um, assigned committees was that if we could use some of our initiatives around where it has the greatest economic impact, that would be a good place to start. And we, we tried to replicate that onto where it had the greatest security impacts. And we found that locally, again, just because of the sheer magnitude of what Los Angeles represents from a shipping standpoint, that it was easy to bring a couple of people together that had that like-minded mind, approach. So we've been able on a regular basis to gather the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the US Secret Service, uh, the United States Coast Guard, and the Department of Homeland Security. But these were local and regional folks to begin with. Although Los Angeles is a very large area and it has some impactful numbers, it represents, I think, the largest customs district in the United States for value of goods that traverse our port and airport that seemed like a logical starting place. Uh, so I would, I would concur with what Henrik said. And that can give you maybe some 
opportunity to showcase or use as a, uh, a pilot advance on what could be done maybe at the national level under your purview. And it, we found, again, some success, meaning that people are still talking to each other respectfully, and they're around the table trying to bring solutions in a very, uh, a very collegial and collaborative environment. Okay, so would anyone else like to respond to that point? Or? No, I, I, you know, I completely concur with what I've been said. At government level, uh, because, you know, generally speaking, government in, in countries, in states, in province, are also in charge of education and training, you know, start doing some, some effort, I'm going to say, or putting some effort into making sure that, again, the new generation have the right training, but the right mindset, and they come with the right behavior when they come to the, uh, to the industry. It's going to be very, very helpful in the, in the years to come. Okay, question from anybody else? Is there anybody else who'd like to put a question to the panel? Gentleman over here, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, Chris Conaditiotis, uh, Chief Executive of Transport Certification Australia, a government organisation. Uh, a lot of the uh, discussions been, uh, have centred around sort of external threats, terrorism in other words. Uh, can we have just some discussion about internal threats? Uh, usually, uh, you know, motivations might be of a commercial nature, but threats in which the uh, proponent knows the system, uh, has possibly even designed the system. So a member of staff? Potentially, yeah. Sure. So insiders? Yeah, the inside threat is probably responsible for 90% 90, 90 or more of the, ins the, the actual incidents that happen because it can be any one of a number of reasons. So it could be both hazard and threat. It could be just sheer negligence or you know, poor behaviour. It could be, ma could be malicious, could be disgruntled employee, it could be any number of reasons. Um, most organisations will deploy a, a, a variety of technologies internally uh, to look out for, and I have to choose my words very carefully, especially given that I'm in Germany, because certain of the techniques and certain of the tools that are used typically by large corporates can't be used in Germany because of you know Ger Ger German legislation, but certainly in the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, the use of uh, user behavior analytics is, is 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 quite common. So there are things you can do to identify if an employee is deviating from his norm, and you can take you can you can um, either take preemptive action or sharpen your surveillance on that in that individual. Uh, but again, everything we've said about an actual external attack applies equally to an internal attack. Once it happens, and it will happen, what determines the success or failure of your company is how quickly you respond to it, how quickly you, A, identified you've been attacked. And this is the concept of the kill chain where, you know, there is a sequence of tasks that is carried out in pursuit of any malicious end, which range at one end from indicators of attack through to indicators of compromise as the attack takes place and then the, the damage is done. The sooner you can identify that you're under attack and the sooner you can generate an appropriate response to that attack and the sooner you can mitigate the impacts of that attack and the sooner you can revert to the normal, the better. And the working assumption has got to be that you will be subject to the attack. The working assumption has got to be that you're going to be subject to the impact and any time you, you dodge the bullet, well, that's a bonus. But you're absolutely right. The, ins the, the insider threat is equally, e is, is equally as bad. There are other ways the insider threat can get in and even be a disgruntled employee. It could actually be somebody who's actively um, working for the other side. And in the case of a nation state a threat actor operating against you, we've seen examples in Ukraine recently where um, people working on the inside in certain elements of Ukrainian critical national infrastructure proved, it proved to be drawing a double salary. Okay, does anyone else care to respond to this? The insider threat. Okay, any more questions at all, please? Is there anyone else who would wish to ask a question? I can't see anybody. I mean, okay, let's, let's, let's move on a little bit in the time that, that is available, addressing the issue of, of vertical integration. And again, it's open to, to anyone really who wants to follow this up at all. But we've noticed that shipping firms, especially more of them, are acquiring port terminals and logistic facilities, even freight train operators. So it means that, that a supply chain becomes concentrated in fewer hands. Doesn't that really make the potential impact of cyber attacks get more substantial? Because it's in fewer hands, the potential there to perhaps 
paralyze whole trades, and there aren't many alternatives. Vertical integration. Yeah, very much so. Uh, so if you could just imagine in your mind's eye, one service provider is responsible for taking the cargo from its origins in, uh, in Shanghai uh, directly into uh, Frankfurt here in Germany. And if something were to happen to that company, those traditional handoffs that went from water to land to rail to truck are now under the, uh, the domicile of one organization. Fortunately enough for us, there are ways to decouple even that integrated uh, supply chain. Much easier said than done, but those possibilities continue to exist. And that's exactly what Henrik just said and what we try to uh, analyze on a regular basis. In looking at our risk management profile that's been developed, updated, and refined over the time that I've been involved, we also look at the fact, and it is pretty simple to us now, that you cannot control everything. It is how you set your risk assessment and what you can do to de-risk those complicated intrusions, activities, or on some occasions, uh, disasters. And with all of that, you're judged more on how you react than anything else. How quickly you can shut down the leak, how quickly you can get back up to a reasonable proximity of normal operating and business procedures, and how reasonable you can stop that intrusion from happening ever again. Now, the interesting thing is that while some of the companies in the shipping sector have tried to look and gotten involved into the vertical integration, there still is a great separation of duties across the supply chain. Having the ability to create a seamless chain is an aspiration that many have today. The ability to execute it and provide visibility to that seamless chain is what some are striving for. But keeping those service provisions separate in management and domain will help us in that situation greatly. Uh, those partnerships that have been designed between the ocean, the truck, the rail, the marine terminal are all very helpful right now. For years in the containerization business, which dates back 55, almost 60 years now, there had been a direct function of the marine aspect or the ship owner having rights and privileges to that waterside or marine terminal typically run by subsidiary fashioned companies, typically using parallel systems, which has become even more evident now. Interconnectivity and the ability to work through an execution platform that is interoperable seems to be more of the dialogue that I'm witnessing today than it is to run off a, sa a same based system for those companies operating in multiple modes. And if you could imagine, in some of the work General Electric is doing today, that execution platform that allows you to bolt on other services. So for example, if your ERP is being run by Oracle today, your ability to plug that, that ERP into the execution platform and the interoperability there is very key. Same as it would be for one of the younger folks today who are so keen on developing the application programming interface or the app that we all have now on our smartphones to get our boarding passes on airplanes, read our morning newspaper. That same technology now is being used with the execution platform. And I'll give you an example. The feed of data that we're working on today crosses over multiple sectors of that transportation provisioning group of companies. But the ability to design that app, which will transfer the information much faster and cleaner than antiquated EDI technology, seems to be a difference maker. But it can also be decompartmentalized from the greater system if, in fact, there has been an intrusion. And although it's early days and we don't know enough just yet, it seems plausible that working in that direction can help us on the example you just provided, Juliet. OK, thank you. And uh, before I put the last question, in fact, to the panel. Is there, is there anybody who would like to, to put another question to them? Please feel free in the time available. Gentlemen over here, thank you. If we can bring in 
a microphone to him. Lovely. If you could introduce yourself as well, yeah, please. My name is Christian Paulsen. Can you? Does it work? Yes. My yep. name is Christian Paulsen. I'm a product and solution security officer for Siemens Mobility. And uh, I heard about standards earlier, ISO 27000, ISO 31000, which are more, let's say, general cybersecurity standards. When it comes to OT, is there anything, any, any common denominator that you in the port arena would also state? I mean, in the rail arena, I hear more and more that ISO, uh, IEC 62443 is the, let's say, the one everyone goes for, and that is a nice framework that helps us as an integrator and as a product supplier interface with the world of uh, an operator with OT. So what, what would be the common denominator in terms of standard in OT? Just Thank very you. very quickly, I think, I think standards are emergent. Some, some industries are already very mature in their acceptance of standards, and rail is a good example of that, and so is, so is, uh, so is logistics, because there is a general acceptance that there have to be standards. Other industries, not so much, and it's made, it's made slightly more complex by the fact that, as we said, in some, some industries, a, a, great, a large amount of legacy architecture or infrastructure is still in place, which makes the imposition of standards difficult. Where I think standards probably have a role to play is in terms of uh, agreements on data exchange, and there, there is some conversation going on, for example, in the field of cybersecurity through McAfee, the McAfee Alliance, for the, the creation of a standardized schema for the exchange of cybersecurity relevant information. So that, you know, th theoretically speaking in the future, any, any, any device, any appliance, any application will spit out its logging in a defined format. While that's not a, a standard I suspect in the sense you were, you were thinking, it's a hell of a lot better than what we've got at the moment. Yeah, but I'll defer this to my, ind my industrial colleagues, won't we? <laughs> So y y you already mentioned some uh, some of the uh, of the standards. I already mentioned some of the initiatives that that the rail industry is is being busy with. I mean, again, uh, here in uh, in Europe, there are programs at EU level uh, shift to rail, and and, and, the, and the Senelec uh, community, which is which is putting uh, together um, some of these standards. And and you already mentioned the IEC, uh, and, and and these are things that we need to rely on. The thing which we need to be uh, cautious about is, is how long those standards are going to, uh, to, to, to take to, to emerge and to get an agreement to. You know, uh, you, you gently uh, said that uh, railway industry is, is uh, all about standard and, the, and that we as an industry, have understood the benefits of the standard. Uh, we could have a, a chat with, uh, with uh, Peter about the, uh, the, the so-called ERTMS standard, which, which uh, is today a standard for a railway in Europe, and it's been 20 years uh, since it started emerging, and, and, and we are not yet there deploying it over, uh, you know, every, everywhere in Europe. So, uh, so my point here is, yes, we need standards. I, I, I'm, I'm all for it. We need to make sure that at the end of the day, we are not dying by standards. And that uh, what the community and, you know, we, s we, we spoke about collaboration between stakeholders and so what the community come up with is something which is practical and, and which really helps rather than uh, being something that we can't figure out how we are going to make it happen. Yeah, I, I'd echo what would be said. And I use the term antiquated with respect to EDI because of just what Stefan said. Whether in our business it's a 309 gate transaction or a 315 milestone on a vessel, et cetera, those standards have been in place for decades now and must be modernized to reflect current activity of what a supply chain looks like today. That's step one. Um, using the skills of folks who have come before us, and ANSI, ANSI rings a bell with many, uh, to help perform what we need to do in data sharing agreements, what data is shared, was a cornerstone of what United States Customs did after the tragic events of 9-11, uh, of where they wanted to form the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, 
and then work towards what they now call the automated manifest system or the 24-hour rule where all shipping companies provide U.S. Customs with a vessel manifest 24 hours before ship sailing in the Trans-Pacific Theater and a similar document was worked forward with the EU cooperation with uh, the U.S. And now getting into that protocol of further information share really can dovetail off of what has already been accomplished so we don't get ourselves caught in, in a spinning or rotation of not moving forward by trying to over-evaluate every section of this. But I still think that we have a lot to learn from the standpoint that in our industry, believe it or not, there are still people that are very combative wanting to have the upper hand in every negotiation versus the opposing party. And that could be based on price, service criteria, or responsibility on the back of a bill of lading. So we'll have to be very careful that those standards in emerging technology become clear so parties who are even a little bit competitive can understand what that platform looks like going forward. And we take some of the friction out of the system to get on to the job of protection and visibility. Okay, an optimistic note on which to end. But uh, I'd like to thank the panel. Your insight has been absolutely phenomenal. Inside knowledge, which certainly from my point of view is a privilege to receive. But uh, thank you to Jean Soroka, Executive Director for the Port of Los Angeles. Thank you. Also, a special thanks to Henrik Kietzner, Principal Business Solution Manager at SAS. Also, Stefan Ferret Beaumont, Vice President, Market and Portfolio at Alstom. And last but not least, Peter Kummer, the Chief Information Officer and member of the Executive Board of the Swiss Federal Railways. Gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>